social media platforms and college campuses are indoctrinating the next generation of Americans with a hatred for Israel that is so fanatical and so visceral that it renders them indifferent to the value of Jewish life. There is an overarching ideology that divides the world into the oppressor versus the oppressed. And for these activists, Israel is the oppressor that can do no right, and Hamas is the oppressed that can do no wrong. And that is the distorting, simplistic lens through which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is seen. Hello and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. The October 7th atrocities shocked the world, but in the Jewish world, it was the fallout that people found most shocking. Jews looked around and suddenly felt abandoned and betrayed by people they thought were their allies, by those who denied or downplayed Hamas's atrocities in the best case, and by those who glorified or celebrated them in the worst. And for no one was that betrayal more painful than for progressive Jews, who suddenly found their allies on so many progressive causes taking the side of Hamas. The latest Harvard-Harris poll shows a shocking one-fifth of Americans support Hamas, not the Palestinians, Hamas. And that problem is even worse on the left, with one quarter of Democrats siding with the October 7 terrorists over the democratic state of Israel. And progressive Jews watched in horror as the people they marched with for gay rights sided with the homophobic Hamas regime. And as the people they marched with for women's rights sided with Hamas rapists. Somehow, hating Israel had become part of a basket of progressive causes. Together with social justice, together with climate justice, together with racial justice and everything else under the sun, and that has put Jews in an impossible predicament. Because suddenly, speaking up for Israel and against anti-Semitism means being cast out of progressive spaces. One of the people pushing back against this horrific development is my guest in today's episode, one of the bravest young politicians in America. Congressman Richie Torres, aged just 36, the representative for New York's 15th Congressional District. Congressman Torres is a minority inside a minority, gay, Afro-Latino, progressive, and proudly Zionist. Boldly making the case that he supports Israel not despite his progressive values, but because of those progressive values. He's someone who gets it who gets that the violent hostility to Israel in progressive spaces isn't really about Israel. It's a new expression of new anti-Semitism. And it's not really about Israel or a threat to Israel. It's a threat to America. And that for progressive causes to thrive, that pathological hatred of Israel has to go. So it was an honor to join Congressman Richie Torres for a special episode of State of a Nation on the road in his office in the Bronx. In a world in which the Jews are increasingly feeling isolated and betrayed, is there hope for more allies like him who'll fight together with them, shoulder with shoulder, for what truly matters? Join me on State of a Nation. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when the four day pause? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? Up you can't do this. Is this is Congressman Richie Torres, thank you for hosting us for this episode of State of a Nation in your offices in the Bronx. Thank you for schlepping to the Bronx. <laughs> it's good to come yes. here all the way from Tel Aviv. Um, you know, in the week that I've been spending here in New York, I've been talking to a lot of American yeah. Jews who felt after 10-7 a sense of betrayal by the yeah. societies around them. They were expecting liberal society that they had been marching shoulder to shoulder with on so many causes to express solidarity or at least sympathy after the attacks and felt that people were turning their backs on them. And I'm wondering where that finds you as a congressman who on the one hand, very progressive. On the other hand, known as one of the most vocal supporters of Israel and the Jewish community in the US, sort of stuck in the middle. Yeah, like yeah. That. Uh, well, look, I, I strive to be an oasis of moral clarity in what increasingly feels like a desert of moral confusion. You know, people often ask me, you know, you're black, 
Latino, gay, millennial from the Bronx, who until recently had no Jewish constituency, you know, why do you care so deeply about combating anti-Semitism? Why do you speak out so forcefully and frequently? And I simply reply, you're asking the wrong question, right? The question is not why have I chosen to be outspoken. The question is why have others chosen to be silent amid the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust? And for me, one need not be Jewish to combat anti-Semitism, just like one need not be black to combat anti-black racism. You know, throughout history, there have been Jewish Americans who paid the ultimate price, who gave their lives for the cause of civil rights. 60 years ago, Andrew Goodman, a Jewish American, Michael Schwerner, a Jewish American, along with James Cheney, an African American, were barbarically murdered in the Mississippi burning so that black Americans could have the right to vote and live freely, unencumbered by the cruelty of Jim Crow. And so for me, the lesson learned from history is that we're all in this together and we all have a moral obligation to speak out against extremism no matter what form it takes and no matter what direction from which it comes, even if it comes from my own ideological backyard. All right, but what I'm hearing from a lot of liberal American Jews is that they're feeling squeezed. Yeah. Their attachments to Israel and the Jewish community are a core part of their identity, yeah. but so is their support for liberal progressive yeah. issues, and they feel that that society has turned against them, and I'm wondering whether you also feel squeezed between, on the one hand, this progressive world that seems to have increasingly turned on Israel, and increasingly yeah. Jews in America feel the Jews, um, and your friendship with the Jewish community. Do you find yourself basically being boxed into a niche where you sort of have to choose a side? Look, there are progressive Jews and progressive members of the progressive community who feel a profound sense of alienation from the progressive movement, which has increasingly become radicalized uh, against Israel, right? There's a sense in which I did not leave the progressive movement, the progressive movement left me. I think that's the feeling among many progressive members of the pro Israel community. I mean, here's an analogy. For a long time in American society, if you were gay, society would tell you that you have to be in the closet. You have to be ashamed of who you are. You have to renounce your identity. There's a sense in which the progressive movement is delivering the same message to pro-Israel Jews. In order to be part of the progressive movement, you have to be in the closet about your Zionism. You have to be ashamed of your Zionism. You have to renounce your identity and your history. And for me, that is not true progressivism. That is a perversion of progressivism. You know, Anat Wilf put it well. She once said that Zionism is a progressive cause that has become a victim of its own success. Hmm. Right? The world demonizes Jews for progressing from victims to sovereigns. And for me, the demonization of Jewish progress in the form of Israel is a perversion of progressivism rather than a true expression of it. And that's what to us seems so messed up with the oppressor-oppressed yeah. paradigm that once you take a group like the Jews that have been historically victimized and persecuted and they rise up and they claim power and claim a voice for themselves, suddenly they get classified as being oppressors as opposed to free. I mean, that should be the end goal of every oppressed group to try to claim that dignity and independence yeah. and equality. Yeah. Look, for me, Zionism is the ultimate form of liberation and decolonization. Right? It's the story of Jewish liberation from, from oppression. And, you know, there is nothing progressive about advocating for the abolition of Israel as a Jewish state. There's nothing progressive about uh, opposing the Abraham Accords, which promotes peace between Israelis and Arabs among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. There's nothing progressive about opposing Iron Dome, which protects civilians from relentless rocket fire. And there's certainly nothing progressive about supporting Hamas, which has butchered and burned, murdered, maimed, and mutilated women and children. For me, the, the truth of those statements is so glaringly obvious that it hardly bears repeating, and yet we have to repeat them because we live in a world of lies. We live in an Orwellian, morally un inverted universe where evil has become good and wrong has become right and terrorism has become resistance. So try to help me understand how everything became topsy-turvy, because to us it's so obvious that Israel should be a progressive cause. Yeah. And even though you know, wanting to destroy the Jewish state, is, there is nothing progressive about that. Increasingly that is entering the basket of what it means to be progressive, so that people who identify as progressive are feeling squeezed out of these spaces. So how did that happen? How did this 
total hostility to Israel, not criticism of Israeli government policy. That's not what we're talking about. Going full in for the abolition of the state of Israel. How did that come to be lumped alongside rights for immigrants and gay rights and the climate? And what do any of these things have to do with each other in the minds of the people who are doing the lumping together? Well, I'll answer your, I'll answer your question by way of, of telling a personal story. When I first announced that I was going to Israel, which was the first time I ever traveled abroad, I'll never forget, I became the target of overwhelming hatred and betrayal. Like there were activists who were offended that I, as a black gay Latino, would go to Israel. When was the first time you visited? It was back, I announced in 2014, and then I went in February of 2015. Mm -hmm. So it was almost a decade ago. And there were activists who held a rally on the steps of City Hall, specifically attacking me. And I remember coming across one activist who had a shirt that read, Queers for Palestine. And so I approached her and I asked, I'm just curious, what is your opinion of Hamas? And I honestly thought she would tell me, well, I, I support Palestinian rights, but of course I condemn a terrorist organization like Hamas. Naturally. And instead she said, oh no, I support Hamas because Hamas is fighting for the liberation of the Palestinian people. She said this a decade ago. A decade ago. And so that was the beginning of my epiphany. You know, the fact that an LGBTQ activist could defend a terrorist organization that systematically and savagely murders LGBTQ people, that to me was as definitive a sign as any of the utter stupidity and moral bankruptcy and absurdity that that BDS has inflicted on progressive politics. But so how did this happen? How did so, they all so, get lumped so together? To answer your question, I came to realize from that moment that the most influential idea on college campuses is the idea of intersectionality. Which, which, and there's an anti-Semitic narrative of intersectionality which holds that you cannot be both pro-Israel and progressive. That in order to be pro-black and pro-Latino and pro-immigrant and pro-LGBTQ, you had to be anti-Israel. So I would go to an immigration reform rally and someone would utter the words from Mexico to Palestine. And I would ask myself, what does Mexico have to do with Palestine? I would go to a criminal justice reform rally and someone would say from Ferguson to Palestine. And I would ask myself, what does Ferguson have to do with Palestine? What do they have to do with each other? Uh, nothing. But, but how did they get but, together? But the, 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 the BDS movement, which is the most successful propaganda movement in the world, has successfully made everything about Israel. It has transformed every progressive cause into a delegitimation campaign against Israel. If you think of anti-Semitism as a virus, intersectionality has become the vector that has carried that virus across a wide range of progressive movements. Uh, and so I saw clearly the insidious anti-Semitism that was creeping into progressive circles. And I felt that I was in a unique position to be a counterbalance. You know, I, I said to people, look, I'm black, I'm Latino, I'm gay, I'm a millennial, I'm from the Bronx, I'm progressive and pro-Israel, and I'm pro-Israel not despite my progressive values, but because of those progressive values. And we're beginning to see in America the emergence of a new generation of pro-Israel progressive leaders, of which I'm one. And it's fascinating that you talk about how BDS has managed to attach anti-Israel activism to all these other progressive yeah. causes, because part of what feels so classically, quintessentially anti-Semitic about this movement is the way that it basically ascribes all the ills of the world yes. to Israel. It's not just we think that yeah. Israel should do ABC. It's if Israel is a climate justice cause and a gay justice cause and an immigration justice cause and everything else, you're falling into the same historical trap of saying the Jews, in this case, through the Jewish state, are at fault for everything. One of the things that in Israel we're tearing our hair out about is trying to understand what is going through the minds of these people who are waving banners saying queers for Palestine. Yeah. You know, people joke and call them chickens for KFC, right? Yeah. Do they not understand? Yeah. Well, you've never been to the Pride Parade in Gaza City, so. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> uh, although there was one soldier who did hold a pride flag yeah. uh, in a very uh, defiant pose there. What is going through these people's minds? Do they not understand that they are lobbying and marching for a virulently hateful terrorist organization that despises their core values and would kill them if it got their hands on them. I, I mean, I think it's a good rule never to show solidarity with people who would murder you. Um, but it's we a rule that's always served me well. It, it strikes me as common sense, but we live in a world of moral confusion and willful ignorance. And, you know, I would attribute the disproportionate drivers of anti-Semitism, particularly in the far left, are academia and social media. 
I'm convinced that social media platforms and college campuses are indoctrinating the next generation of Americans with a hatred for Israel that is so fanatical and so visceral that it renders them indifferent to the value of Jewish life. There is an overarching ideology that divides the world into the oppressor versus the oppressed. And for these activists, Israel is the oppressor that can do no right, and Hamas is the oppressed that can do no wrong. And that is the distorting, simplistic lens through which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is seen. You know, Maddie Friedman brilliantly describes this as the Americanization of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We, we, we have applied an American concept where it doesn't belong. Right, it makes no sense for yeah. us as Israelis. An immigrant country, yeah. everyone has at least one, a, a two, multiracial, three, four, multi-ethnic multi-ethnic democracy. Yeah. Grandparents were not only immigrants, but refugees yeah. to be spoken of in terms of colonizers stealing land when they say, but we are refugees returning to our ancestral land. This American lens makes no sense. And I'm wondering for us as Israel, but, but also for the Jewish community here in America, I mean, have we lost the progressive world? Do, do we just have to write them off and say, listen, they're simply never going to be with us? Or can we still get them on side? Well, the majority of young people identify as progressive, so um, I, we cannot accept that we've lost it. I think we have to fight for the hearts and minds of the next generation, but the odds are stacked against us, given what is unfolding on college campuses and on social media platforms, but that should motivate us to fight even harder. Uh, and um, I, I believe that the security of Israel depends heavily on the U.S.-Israel relationship, and the U.S.-Israel relationship depends on the next generation of Americans whose hearts and minds have to be one. On campuses, I've been speaking to Jewish students who feel that they don't have allies or alliances yeah. with other groups that have come out swinging for them, and here's where your position really is extraordinary and unique. And I think one of the elements of disillusionment that the Jewish community in America is feeling so they feel so proud of their role in the civil rights movement and fighting for the civil rights of the black community in America. And they look at what is happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, the famous incident from Chicago adopting the yeah. paragliders that swooped in to rape, pillage and murder people at the Nova Festival. And some people feel that they've lost the black community. And they say that with a lot of pain. Um, but the black community has aligned itself with the Palestinian cause and turned against them. Does that resonate with you? Does that, does I, that chime I, with how you I, see reality? I feel like there are facts that would complicate the perception okay. and the narrative of a strain in black Jewish relations. So um, I reject the notion that Chicago BLM is fundamentally representative of the black community. Um, the, the, the strongest defenders of Israel as a Jewish state here in the United States are often black elected officials. Hmm. Uh, like myself, Mayor Eric Adams from New York City, Hakeem Jeffries, who's, Hakeem Jeffries, who's well positioned to be the future Speaker of the House, uh, and the overwhelming majority of both the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus remain strongly pro-Israel. And I would make a few more points. Um, I would argue that the older African-American electorate has been a moderating force in the Democratic Party. Were it not for older African-American voters, Bernie Sanders rather than Joe Biden would have been the Democratic nominee. How so? Well, Bernie Sanders' base was mostly white progressives, mm. and Biden won on the strength of the African-American vote in places like South Carolina. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and so I would argue that the African-American vote has been a moderating force in the Democratic Party to the benefit of the U.S. Israel relationship. Or you look at a congressional race like Ohio 11. Right? There was a pro-Israel candidate, uh, Chantel Brown, versus Nina Turner, an anti-Israel candidate. Chantel Brown won on the strength of a black Jewish coalition. And so the reality is far more nuanced than people make it out to be. What I have come to discover is that young people of all races, you know, are increasingly skeptical and critical and even outright hostile toward Israel. And so the, the rise of anti-Zionism in America is not so much a racial as it is a generational phenomenon. Why is that? I think those young people have been ideologically captured by social media, particularly TikTok, and college campuses. Um, when people ask me, 
why are you so pro-Israel? I tell them it's because I dropped out of college. <laughs> so. What about the Hispanic community? Because you straddle both of these worlds, both black yeah. but also Puerto Rican. Yeah. Where do the Hispanics align on the question of Israel? How did they respond to 10-7? Where are they in terms of alliances with the Jewish community? I think community? it's about generation. I, I think younger people of every background are, are much less sympathetic toward Israel. That's what I have found. Um, and so we have to fight our heart out to persuade the next generation. And what advice then would you give to Jewish students on campus, others who believe in the importance of the US-Israel relationship, about how we start to claw back from the twisted ideology that has cast Israel as, you know, the devil incarnate, and say that the American-Israel friendship is something not only obvious, but of vital importance. How, how do we fight for that when the odds are so stacked against us? Look, I, I would, for me, the greatest threat to the U.S.-Israel relationship comes not from the far right or from the far left. It comes from the complacency and cowardice of a center that lives in fear of the extremes. Franklin Roosevelt once said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And so I would tell you know, my brothers and sisters in the Jewish diaspora, you know, no need to live in fear. We need you to speak out. We need you to stand up. Because if you do not defend the U.S.-Israel relationship, no one else will. And there are people who do live in fear of the extremes and who engage in self-censorship. And the key to winning the hearts and minds of the next ge generation is breaking that cycle of self-censorship and, and, and advocating for Israel, not from a place of fear, but from a place of strength. So you think it's a question that we still have many people who are on our side, natural friends and allies, but they feel, what, scared, intimidated to speak, and it's a question of engaging in battle and not running away from like the battlefield? I feel like there are both Jewish and non-Jewish allies of Israel who are censoring themselves out of fear. Fear of what? Because I'm hearing this a lot, yeah. and I'm wondering what, what exactly it is they are scared about. Fear of being canceled, of being excluded from polite society, actual violence? Well, fear of rejection. Um, you know, my, my, um, I've had to pay a personal price, right? I, I, I am one of the most demonized elected officials in America because I support Israel. You know, my mother has been the target of harassment because of support for my for Israel, and they've, they've I, I've lost come family. out against your mother. Yeah, I've lost family relationships, friendships. There's no issue on which I face more hate, harassment, and death threats than on the subject of Israel. And so I do have colleagues who conclude it's not worth it. That yes, I support Israel, but I'm going to remain quiet because it's not worth the cost of facing the wrath of the far left and the far right. Do you fear for your physical safety? You know, one of my favorite movies is The Godfather and The Godfather Two, and I'm reminded of a quote from Hyman Roth who said, this is the life we've chosen. So I, I know what I've signed up for. Because there are people trying to bully you into taking a, I mean, turning your back on Israel and the Jewish community. And I can see that for many people, that's simply the easy option to do. Yeah. So I wonder why why you are so vocal in making this point, because you can, I mean, one option is simply to keep your head down and say, I'm not getting involved in this, it's not worth it. So I'm wondering how you as a congressman have somehow become one of the most powerful voices for the US-Israel friendship. I refuse to live in fear. Uh, I feel that the Achilles heel of most elected officials is a pathological need to be loved. And I, for one, have no need to be loved. For me, it's better to do the right thing than to be loved. Like, integrity matters more than popularity. And so I'm willing to stand for what I believe is right, even if it means standing alone. So what have you been doing then? Because it's one thing to tweet and give yeah. speeches, and that yeah. is hugely appreciated. But in terms of your work on the Hill, yeah. what have you been doing legislative-wise? Yeah, so I partnered with a Republican, Mike Lawler, mm -hmm. to advance bipartisan legislation that would establish a special envoy for the Abraham Accords. It was included in the National Defense Authorization Act. Because for me, the Abraham Accords, there's nothing more powerful than an Arab rejection of BDS. And the Abraham Accords is an Arab repudiation of BDS. Which We've I think is what drove, drove so many people yeah, gaga, that they exactly. thought that they had the whole Arab world on side against Israel, and realized that actually Arabs in the region think there's a future for peace and cooperation and trade with Israel. And so I'm, you know, despite the events, the tr you know, the tragedy of October 7th and its aftermath, uh, I, I remain fundamentally optimistic 
that we are as close as we've ever been to realizing the Abrahamic dream of Jews, Christians, and Muslims coexisting in peace and prosperity. What about on the anti-Semitism front? Is that something that needs to be fought at a local yeah. a level, on a federal level? What are you doing about that? So uh, obviously there's, it's, it's a multifaceted problem, but when it comes to anti-Semitism, you know, there, there's nothing unprecedented about anti-Semitism, which is an ancient hatred. What is unprecedented is the algorithmic amplification of anti-Semitism on social media. Mm. So there's the problem of social media in general. Yes, if we say anti-Semitism is a virus, then now we have a platform that literally makes it go viral. Exactly right. Uh, to an extent we've never seen before. Uh, but then there's the problem of TikTok in particular, which is a prohibitive national security risk for the United States. And keep in mind... Why a national security risk? Well, TikTok is not merely a, 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 a social media platform. It is the leading news source for the next generation of Americans. And the fact that the United States has put the leading news source for the most impressionable American minds in the hands of its leading foreign adversary, the Chinese Communist Party, to me is an act of self-sabotage. Um, as a New Yorker who lived through 9-11, I never thought in my wildest dreams that Osama bin Laden's letter to America would be trending it's insane. on TikTok. It's absolutely insane. And so I support legislation that would force a sale of TikTok to an American company or to a company in an allied country, uh, you know, we have to strike while the iron's hot. And this is gonna be the best opportunity we have to confront anti-Semitism on the TikTok platform. Because what is the fear about how TikTok is being used or manipulated to change public opinion? Well, I think there's, there's, look, there's no visibility into the workings of these algorithms, but there's concern that you could easily weaponize the algorithm to amplify anti-Semitism, to amplify anti-Zionism and suppress uh, the, the pro-Israel perspective. And there's evidence that that is happening with greater frequency and intensity on TikTok and on other social media platforms. You know, I see it as a form of information warfare. And what makes, infor what makes information warfare so insidious is that it's an enemy that you cannot see. Um, Richie, before we wrap up, I want to play a game with you. Sure. It's called Richie Torah. Richie Torah, yes. Richie Torah, which Rabbi I understand Abi is your yes. nickname. Yes. Exactly. How did you get this nickname, Richie Torah? Uh, I, one of the most prominent rabbis uh, from Riverdale in the Bronx is Avi Weiss, who has spent much of his time in Israel in the wake of October 7th. But he famously referred to me as Richie Torah. Richie so, Torah. So good, let's go. I'm on a quick fire now yeah. where I want to ask you uh, about... I, I once said that I was... a. Uh, Ethiopian Jew and Israeli said, well, you're not attractive enough to be Ethiopian. So. Ouch. I, I've been oh, a victim brutal. of Israeli bluntness. That's brutal. So, um, they, are, they are very blunt, yes, and yes. I don't think it's fair. Okay. Let me ask you a quick uh, rapid fire. What is your favorite Jewish food? Shawarma. Shawarma. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Not going for the classic New York uh, lox bagel no. or uh, gefilte fish. I, I'm a meat person. Mad. Okay. Favorite Jewish holiday? Uh, oh. Uh, Hanukkah. Why Hanukkah? I just love the, the story of the Maccabean Revolt. What part of it? Which is relevant. I feel like it's relevant to our own time. So, I, you know, the Maccabees were fighting for the right of Jews to exist as Jews in the face of an existential threat, which at the time was um, Antiochus IV under the Seleucid Empire. And today, Jews are fighting for the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state in the face of a new existential threat which to me is ultimately the Islamic Republic of Iran. So the parallels speak to this moment. You have a favorite Jewish movie? My favorite Jewish movie. You might have stumped me there. Uh, I mean, Seinfeld is a great Jewish TV sitcom. We'll so. go with Seinfeld. Seinfeld, then. so. Favorite Jewish historical figure? Favorite Jewish historical figure? Um, well, apart from Abraham and Moses? <laughs> uh, it's interesting, uh, a friend of mine gave me advice, uh, he says, when in doubt, quote Jonathan Sachs, okay. who is eminently quotable. So Jonathan Sachs is among my favorite Jewish figures. But That is the correct answer. of course, answer. Theodore Herzl. And and as a British Jew, you would appreciate the genius all, of all. Jonathan Sachs. So, uh. <laughs> uh, finally, if you were to host a Shabbat dinner and host three guests, alive or dead, who would they be? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, Necessarily, does it have to be Jewish? No. Okay. I would say, uh, so I am one of my, one of my good friends is Noah Tishby, who has been 
the most powerful Israeli voice against anti-Semitism here in the United States. So I would, I would ask nowhere to come. Uh, I have great... I'm saying you can invite anyone, so it doesn't have to yeah. be from your close circle of friends. Like, go wild. And I would say uh, Yusef Oteba, who is the UAE ambassador to the United States. He is the most brilliant diplomat I've ever met. Uh, not only is he has a deep historical knowledge, but he just knows people, he knows relationships, he's an architect of the Abraham Accords. And if we can summon summon someone in a time machine? And I would say, uh, I was going to ask you to say, maybe the spokesperson for Israel. <laughs> Alain Levy, I think. Well, that sounds like an Alain, interesting dinner. Alain, Youssef, and Noah. And, sounds and like I, the beginning of a bad joke. Yeah, it's, you know, that would be a good dinner. Okay, yeah. let's make it happen. And Congressman Richie Torres, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of State of a Nation. Thank you very much to Congressman Richie Torres for hosting us live in location from his uh, office in the Bronx. As always, please like, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll continue with the next episodes back in Tel Aviv. Thank you for watching.